Εξοχότατη κυρία Πρέσβη, αξιότιμε κύριε Γενική Γραμματέα, αξιότιμοι συνάδελφοι και φίλοι, κυρίες και κύριοι. Είναι μεγάλη μου χαρά και τιμή να σας καλωσορίσω απόψε σε αυτή τη μεγαλοπροπή αίθουσα και να σας παρουσιάσω το έργο της Βρετανικής Σχολής Αθηνών το 2018. Καταρχάς, θα ήθελα να εκφράσω εκ μέρος της Βρετανικής Σκολής τις θερμές μας ευχαριστίες στο Γενικό Γραμματέα της Εναθήνας Αρχαιολόγικης Εταιρείας, κ. Βασιλείο Πρετράκο, και στο προσωπικό της Εταιρείας για την φιλεξινία τους. Επίσης, ευχαριστώ θερμότατα το προσωπικό της Βρετανικής Σκολής στην Ελλάδα και στην Αγγλία για την συμβολή του στο έργο της Σκολής, το οποίο θα παρουσιάσω σήμερα. Your Excellency, Mr. General Secretary, distinguished colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome you to, to the annual open meeting of the British School at Athens. I begin by expressing the school's gratitude to the Secretary General of the Archaeological Society in Athens, Dr. Vasilios Petrakos, and to his staff for hosting this event once more in this magnificent venue. I also add my thanks as Director to all the BSA staff, both here in Greece and the UK, for everything they have contributed to the program of work that I summarise this evening. If there's a key word to describe the past year's effort by the BSA, it is engagement. Engagement by our supporters, researchers and staff, and engagement with many diverse partners in carrying out our program of activities, both in Greece and in the UK. And on the note of engagement, I begin this presentation with a reminder of an occasion at Knossos. In May, on the last day of their official visit to Greece, their Royal Highnesses, the Prince of Wales and Duchess of Cornwall, visited Crete, where they toured the site of Knossos, guided by the then Minister of Culture and Sports, Mrs. Lydia Koniordou, and the Secretary General of the Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Sports, Dr. Maria Vlazaki. At the entrance to the site, in front of the Evans bust, the director presented a Linear B tablet he'd made to commemorate the occasion. His Royal Highness then moved on to the Knossos Research Centre to experience Cooking Like Minoans, co-organised by Branding Heritage and the British School at Athens to mark European Year of Cultural Heritage 2018. He observed the preparation of food by Geraldine Morrison, a PhD from the University of Leicester, following ancient practices reconstructed from archaeological evidence. He also visited the Stratigraphical Museum, where he was shown a selection of materials relating to food and consumption, and learnt about research in progress there, and about the Knossos curatorial project. The visit was widely covered by the media, social and otherwise, including Clarence House's own Twitter feed. I'm pleased to note that following his May visit, his Royal Highness formally renewed his patronage of the BSA for a further five years. Maintaining our, and growing our profile and our support base remains crucial at the moment, at a point when, as everyone here is well aware, there's a great deal of uncertainty in the UK. It follows, therefore, that as I noted last year, communication remains vital, both within the BSA and especially beyond it to our stakeholders. Communication takes many forms, physical through our newsletter, shown here, and digital, passively via our recently enhanced and updated website, and actively through social media, Facebook and Twitter. We continue to record many of our events on our YouTube channel, now fully embedded on our website, and through these means we seek to continue to raise our profile and thus grow our support base here in Greece and in the UK and indeed worldwide. We engage the academic community through our publications, of course. In 2018, we not only published our two print journals, shown here on the left, the Annual of the British School at Athens and Archaeological Reports, the latter in collaboration with the Hellenic Society, but also a further volume in the Keros Naxos project series appeared, and we will shortly publish the next in our, renewed, in our supplementary volume series, Palekastro Building 1, on the bottom on the right. We are pleased to note a renewed momentum for this series and further volumes are currently in progress. We also published two more volumes in our successful Modern Greek and Byzantine Studies series, published by Routledge. 
the British Council and Anglo-Greek Literary Interactions, 1945 to 1955, and only last month, Assistant Director Krisanthi Papadopoulou's edited volume, The Culture of Ships and Maritime Narratives. This is the appropriate moment to mention that Krisanthi's term as Assistant Director will end this June. I therefore take this opportunity to thank her most warmly for everything she has done for the BSA. She has supported both myself and my predecessor most effectively. She has carried out an, effect, an active research program, reflected not only in her recently published volume just mentioned, but also as assistant director to Stella Domestica of the Matsutos Shipwreck Project. Her intellectual breadth has offered fresh perspectives to the academic life in Athens, not least in a series of seminars on archaeology and psychoanalysis she organized two years ago. She was a finalist for the British Council Alumni Awards last year and had the opportunity to meet some interesting figures, Jimmy Chu, for example, and also to visit interesting places, including Buckingham Palace. On behalf of the BSA, I offer her our very best wishes for the future, and I'm pleased to announce her successor has been appointed, just been appointed, Michael Loy of Cambridge University, who will take up his post on the 1st of July. As Assistant Director, Chrysanthi also oversees our teaching program, including the undergraduate summer course in the Archaeology and Topography of Greece, which has run for the past 46 years continuously. The BSS program of activities in 2018 was extensive, and I emphasize once again our role as facilitator of research. We bring UK researchers into contact with their counterparts in Greece and vice versa. We also offer links to the other foreign schools and institutes in Athens, whose number is still growing. Although I, like my fellow directors, am dismayed and disappointed to learn of the severe threat to its continued operation currently faced by the Norwegian Institute in Athens. Public lectures in Athens included the annual Michael Freda lecture delivered by David Sedley uh, on uh, Xenocrates and the invention of Platonism a lecture to mark Athens as world book capital by William St. Clair on who saved the Parthenon, and the annual uh, National Hellenic Research Foundation BSA Institute of Classical Studies lecture delivered by Professor Firoz Vasunya uh, on the prose of the world, Hegel, Herodotus, and Plutarch. The BSA also co-sponsored a, a conference in Thessaloniki on the Macedonian front and contributed to Philoxeni Archaeologia, a conference organized by the Ministry of Culture and Sport to celebrate the foreign schools in Greece. Upper house seminar topics included musical topographies of late Ottoman Istanbul, the Romaica dialect of Greek in Turkey, the potter's art in Latin Greece by Florence Liar, the sawn blocks of the Parthenon frieze by Vasilia Manidaki, the modern history of Greek homosexuality by Dimitris Paponikolaou, and a provocative talk on modern encounters with classical Greece by Dimitris Plantsos. Armand Duroy launched the Greek translation of The Lagoon, his book on Aristotle's natural history, Alicia Starling's, her new translation of Hesiod's Works and Days, and Cathy Morgan and Ksenia Charalambidou presented their edited volume interpreting the 7th century BC. In the UK, Director General of Antiquities, Dr. Polixeni Adam Veleni, delivered the annual BSA Institute of Classical Studies lecture on the Thessal Thessaloniki Metro discoveries, and only last month, we held twin panel discussions in both Athens and London on translations, modern Greek literature through a translator's lens. The number of collaborations that this rich program represents are too numerous to list here. Our A.G. Levendis postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Irini Avramopoulou, moved on to take up a lectureship at Pandion University, another success for the Levendis Fellowship Program. Irini jointly organized a powerful seminar series in collaboration with the Ecole Francaise d'Athènes uh, and the British Institute at Ankara on mobilities in and of crisis. She is succeeded as A.G. Levendis Fellow by Dr. Bella Dimova, formerly a postdoc in Cambridge, who works on the textile economy in the North Aegean and neighboring regions. There will be more to say about Bella's work in future reviews. Visiting fellow Stephen Lambert from Cardiff worked on Attic inscriptions, while, at a different end of the academic spectrum, his counterpart as early career fellow, Irini Karamuzi from Sheffield, a newcomer to the BSA, used her stay to initiate a new project, Forging a New Civil Society, Peace Movements and Democracy in Greece, 1975 to 1989. 
Irini also curated an exhibition at the Hellenic Parliament Foundation, fighting for peace in the 1980s, Greece, Italy, and Spain. As Macmillan Rodevolt student, Dr. Hugh Halstead from York studied the human effects of the Anadasmos undertaken in the late 1960s and early 70s in the Karditsa Plain in Western Thessaly. He explored how this period is remembered today by those who experienced it, examining the strategies the residents of the Karditsa Plain employed to make their landscape familiar once more. Unrelated to his BSA research, Hugh's first book, Greeks Without Greece, was just published also by Routledge. Anna Moles from University College London spent the final year of her doctoral research in Athens with a six-month BSA Richard Bradford McConnell studentship followed by an Anassis Fellowship hosted at the BSA. Using legacy material from BSA excavations at Knossos from the 1930s to the 1970s, she studied human skeletal remains from Hellenistic, Roman, and late antique tombs around the Knossos Valley in order to track changing health and diet in relation to large-scale social changes across this time period. A key element in her research was contextual information in the BSA archive for these largely unpublished tombs. Also from UCL, Carlotta Gardner's project, From East to West, an assessment of metalworking traditions through the analysis of pre-Roman and Roman crucibles, investigated the spread of a tradition identified during her doctoral research on Roman metalworking crucibles in Britain. She is now pursuing a postdoctoral project on the production of loom weights and mortaria at the Fitch Laboratory as its new Williams Fellow. Our arts bursary holder in 2018 was Larice Douglas. Her intensive immersion in the BSA informed presentations at a number of venues, including a talk entitled The Value of Fragments, delivered both in London and in Athens. Larice also visited the Kutralu Magula project to experience the sights and sounds of an excavation in progress. At the end of her residency, she presented two framed photographs, which now hang in the library and the hostel foyer. Archaeology, of course, features prominently in our research portfolio, and our work would not be possible without the cooperation and assistance of numerous colleagues in the Ministry of Culture and Sports. Before summarising our fieldwork in 2018, I begin by expressing the school's gratitude to the staff of the Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Sports, we are most grateful to Dr. Maria Andreadaki Blazaki, Secretary General of the Ministry, and to Drs. Eleni Korka and Polixeni Adam Veleni, successive Directors General of Antiquities, as well as to the numerous colleagues in the Ministry who make our archaeological work possible. In particular, we thank those in charge of the regions in which our major fieldwork took place Dr. Dimitris Athanasoulis, Effort of Antiquities of Cyclades, Dr. Stella Chrysoulaki, Effort of Antiquities of Piraeus and the Islands. Dr. Angeliki Simosi, Effort of Antiquities of Evia, Mr. Ioannis Kanonidis, Effort of Antiquities of Chalkidiki and Mount Athos, Dr. Ephthemia Karantsali, uh, Effort of Antiquities of Theotida and Evritania, Dr. Panayota Kasimi, Effort of Antiquities of Corinthia, Mrs. Evangelia Pandu, Effort of Antiquities of Laconia, Dr. Alkistis Pampathimitriou, Effort of Antiquities of the Argolid, Mrs. Chrysa Sofianou, Effort of Antiquities of Lasithi, and Dr. Vasiliki Sithiakaki, Effort of Antiquities of Heraklion. All our projects in 2018 explored urban living at different scales and in different periods. Further details appear in our December 2018 newsletter and also in AG Online. Moving chronologically, I start uh, in Middle Neolithic Thessaly, where the Kutralu Magula project, a collaboration between the BSA and the Effort of Antiquities of Theotida and Evritania, focused in 2018 on exploration of the slope and periphery of this Middle Neolithic tell site, while excavation also continued on its top. Striking results came from the slope and periphery of the tell. In 2018, uh, a new trench, uh, X, uh, C14, was opened, yielding many finds, particularly chipped stone, including a rare, possibly late Neolithic spear point made of honey chert, most likely from present-day Bulgaria. In 2017, the first evidence for possible pottery kiln was revealed here, while this year's investigations suggest the possibility, yet to be confirmed, that there may have been a series of kiln installations in various stages of preservation. In the same area, an adult inhumation burial was uncovered, probably dating to the medieval period, like that found on top of the mound in 2011. This is yet to be confirmed by AMS dating. 
More striking results, however, came from the edge of the settlement, in Trench He 16, placed to identify and record the edges of the ditch that appeared in the magnetometer survey in 2011 to 12. In 2018, this ditch was identified and its west and east edges located. It was approximately six meters wide and may have been deeper than three meters. The fill contained abundant pottery and other finds, including many sl clay sling pellets. Eroded pottery and figuring fragments suggest exposure and deposition over time, indicating a slowly accumulated fill. The importance of this find for spatial and social practices in the Neolithic and for communal organisation at the site is considerable. In addition to its archaeological activities, the project continued its programmes in ethnography, education, community archaeology and theatre archaeology, including a performance of itineraries devised by Electra Angolopoulou, focusing on archaeological finds, memory, place and landscape, including the migration history of local villages, especially those in nearby Neo Monastiri. 2018 saw the fourth and final season, field season of the Keros Naxos Seaways project, which has focused on the Mikres Kiklades, the archipelago between Naxos, Eos and Amorgos. Combining survey with excavation, it has uncovered remarkable evidence for architecture and town planning, craft activities, and the widespread import of raw materials and finished goods. The first clear evidence for incipient urbanization in the early Cyclades. On Vascalio, six excavation trenches were open. The largest trench, A, was located on the gently sloping northwest plateau below the summit, offering the only large, relatively flat area on the islet. Excavations in 2016 and 17 had removed very large quantities of collapsed stone. And in 2018, clear outlines of buildings and pathways connecting them were revealed, while excavation at floor level and below produced unexpected results. At the north end of the trench, a passageway tentatively identified in 2017 is now fully identified with three branches facilitating traffic in several directions. At the convergence of the three access routes is a flat area of flagstones. This nodal point was the intersection of key paths leading north, east, southeast and west as well as south into the main building in trench A. Here two rooms were excavated to bedrock. One of these contained a concentration of stone tools and discs framed by slabs embedded in the floor. Below the floor levels, here and to the south, simple hearths used for metalworking, the casting of copper, were located in bedrock hollows. Two trenches were set on the north side of the islet to investigate a network of impressive walls visible before the start of the excavation. Trench B lay immediately north of Trench A to identify a pathway from these large walls to the area of Trench A. Results in 2018 were spectacular. A flight of steps led from the bottom of the trench to an area of flagstones marked by no less than four petroglyphs at the point where the path divides. It has been argued that petroglyphs at other sites, such as Vathi and Astipalia, mark important points on paths of movement. This is confirmed by the Vascalio staircase. The stair also covered a drain whose terminus was located a few metres north of the trench at the cliff edge, one of several complex drains found in the excavations. The path divided midway up the trench, one branch went left into unexcavated areas and the other went to the right, probably meeting up with the passageways located in trench A. Finally, a third metallurgical hearth was located in this trench, in close association with a baking pan, which when examined by portable X-ray fluorescence, showed raised levels of copper. Downslope to the east, Trench H had already revealed the main entranceway to the site. In 2018, excavation proceeded through several relayed floors in the two rooms to the south of the entrance, reaching bedrock. That's Trench H. Here, two metallurgical hearths were found, one showing evidence for vitrification resulting from very high temperatures. The five hearths now found at Dasgalio constitute unique direct evidence for the production of metal artifacts at this time. Upslope on, the, upslope on the east side of the island, two nearby trenches were excavated. Trench E was placed over the massive passageway through the largest terrace wall on the islet, just below the summit. Here, another petroglyph was located, just above the stairs on the south side. Trench N, immediately to the east, revealed a complex of walls. Some of these date to the earliest period of the site, phase A, 
providing crucial evidence for this earliest period, contemporary with the main use of the two special deposits located on Caros across the causeway. However, it is clear that the florowit of Lascalior was in phase B, after the main period of use of the special deposits. At the same time as the excavation of Lascalior, field survey was carried out on the nearby island of Catacufonisi. Survey of this small island, only just, over, just under four kilometers square, complements the large surveys carried out earlier on Keros and on southeast Naxos. Results suggest Catacufonisi was more densely inhabited in the early Bronze Age than either Naxos or Keros, with at least one major site towards its western end. Late Roman and modern are the other two main periods evidence with traces of Mycenaean and geometric habitation. The project now moves into the study and publication phase, its results to be published in three volumes by the Macdonald Institute for Archaeological Research in Cambridge. The project has, however, already demonstrated that Dascalio was the largest known settlement of its period in the Cyclades, with a planned and impressive architecture, prodigious evidence for metalworking, and import of materials both from surrounding islands and further afield. In 2018, the Knossos Gipsades project, in collaboration with the Heraklion Ephorate of Antiquities, continued to investigate a neighborhood within the southern suburbs of the Bronze Age megacity of Knossos, combining study with further investigation of the larger site. Eleni Hadzaki completed study of stratigraphy, architecture, and ceramics in the various trenches excavated and marked in yellow on the plan on the left. She established a phasing that will facilitate completion of studies by specialists investigating artifacts, archaeobotanical and zooarchaeological material, and geoarchaeological samples. Sarpetsidaki, Ayala, and Bogard, with John Pouncet from Oxford, carried out geophysical and geoarchaeological field survey in order to place the excavated area within its wider local context. The first objective was to map in detail subsurface features by integrating magnetometry, resistivity, and ground penetrating radar, GPR. A second objective was to investigate the stratigraphy of key anomalies using sediment coring, and core locations are indicated with the small numbers on the plan on the left. This will also enable the retrieval of potential dating material. Magnetometer survey in the southern part of the plot showed an extensive array of positive black and negative white anomalies consistent with archaeological features and deposits. A broad positive linear magnetic anomaly aligned from north to south in the center of the area may correspond to a road or trackway, while a denser cluster of orthogonal negative magnetic anomalies identified immediately to its west may reflect a complex of buildings. The findings of the 2008 field 2018 field season show considerable potential for integrated geophysics and geoarchaeological prospection, which can be brought into dialogue with existing excavation, geophysical survey, and archival landscape data. 2018 saw the fifth season of our collaboration with the effort of Chalchidiki and Ionoros at the site of Olynthos. In pursuit of their aim to recover a uniquely detailed picture of Greek households as social and economic units within their broader neighborhood, urban, and regional settings, a major goal for the 2018 season on the North Hill was to continue investigation of House B96, working towards completely revealing its occupation phase and investigating the range and distribution of activities taking place there. The picture of the layout of this house in its final phase is now more coherent. As hypothesized in 2015, the house was entered from the street from the south via corridor L. Space H appears to be an andron on the basis of its position and other features, although the team has not located a plaster or mosaic floor. West of the andron, the southern facade of the house is poorly preserved, while the western boundary wall of the house is very well preserved, surviving to a height of at least five courses in places, acting as a terrace to retain the soil beneath the significantly higher floors of the neighboring house to the west. Within the main room of the oikos, or ikos unit, F, a large rectangular structure of baked clay was partly revealed, perhaps used for some kind of manufacturing or processing. The absence of ashes or signs of burning suggested it was not a hearth. Surface collections on the left were carried out in a total of 80 grid squares on the north hill and indicated dense settlement in antiquity, the majority of the pottery dating to the classical period. Beyond the confines of the archaeological site, shown on the right, 
Field walking continued in 2018 of an area, over an area of just over one square kilometer of the lower city, mostly north of the North Hill. Artifact density was relatively low, and as in previous years, most of the material discovered again dated to the classical period with small amounts of Byzantine and late Roman pottery. On the South Hill, work continued in stratigraphic trench TT23, located in the southwestern part of the ancient city, started in 2017 in order to investigate the potential date at which the grid there was established. Continued excavation in 2018 revealed deposits that demonstrate the potential for uncovering the earliest phases of settlement on the South Hill, including an installation or hearth predating the Persian destruction. A fourth and final season of geophysics was completed elsewhere at Knossos with the overall goal of providing a spatial framework in which to situate excavated material from Roman Knossos. The city's layout in its latest period of occupation appears to have had at least three different orientations, probably largely driven by topography. Work in 2018 further supported previous indications that Roman inhabitants of Knossos used Minoan architectural features in the layout of portions of the city. The large-scale landscape interventions of the Bronze Age may thus have impacted on the inhabitants of, Roman, of the Roman city some 2,000 years later. Four seasons of investigation here also demonstrated the efficacy of aggregate uh, geophysical data within this landscape to reconstruct a fuller picture of Knossos's urban topography. In 2018, a further one and a half hectares were covered with ground-penetrating radar, making a total of three hectares covered with this method. Although interpretation of all results has yet to be finalized, the data revealed are intriguing. Rectilinear features are evident, usually in the 1.5 to 2.5 meter depth range, and there may also be evidence of activity areas, roads, and some terracing, as indicated in the overall interpretation that you see on the right. Continued exploration with the ground penetrating radar on the area of the Villa Dionysos shows another courtyard house on the western terrace above the current villa. To the south, there is clear evidence for a street in both the magnetometry and the ground penetrating radar data. North of the villa, there is another possible courtyard structure or an extension of the villa itself. The area around the Makritikos provided perhaps the most immediately satisfying GPR data in 2018. As previously suggested, the standing wall is probably the back of a terrace supporting a stoa and associated structures. GPR not only showed most of the stoa, but also five of the column bases on the interior colonnade. Also visible is the eastern return of the stoa wall. Lingering in Knossos for a moment, one of the benefits of being an institution with a long history is the aggregation of significant amounts of legacy material. With such material, however, comes a double challenge. How to meet the concomitant obligation to make it available to the academic public, and how to do so in a form that meets modern standards. The rich material produced by generations of scholars at Knossos presents a particular challenge that we're meeting in various ways. One initiative involves the House of the Frescoes, a structure excavated by Sir Arthur Evans and Duncan Mackenzie in 1923 and 1926, and restored by Nicolas Platon in 1958-59. It was cleaned in July 2018 under the supervision of the effort of Antiquities of Heraclium to facilitate republication, republication of the building's architecture and finds to modern standards by Emilia Oddo of Tulane University with the assistance of Vasso Fautou of Oxford. The unexpected discovery of Evans's notebook of, of 1926 enabled Oddo to correlate the numbers on this sketch plan with wooden labels retained in the pottery boxes of the Stratigraphical Museum, and thus to identify the fine spots of the pottery both inside and outside the building correcting discrepancies in the existing literature. Cleaning and restudy have thus enabled Otto to reconstruct, in broad outline, a history of use of the site before, during, and after the lifetime of the House of the Frescoes itself. She plans to complete publication in 2020. Returning to Athens, as it were, the Fitz Laboratory, directed by Evangelia Kiriadzi, and now in existence for over 30 years, hosts and facilitates research in various fields of science-based archaeology, including human osteology and zooarchaeology, contributing to their full integration within archaeological practice in Greece. Two such projects hosted this year 
focus on bioarchaeological remains from prehistoric sites recently excavated as rescue excavations by the Greek Archaeological Service. Dimitris Filioglou, an environmental archaeology MSc graduate from Sheffield, used the Fitz Bursary to carry out study of the animal bones from the final Neolithic and early Bronze Age deposits at Proskinas in Locris, excavated by Eleni Zahu of the effort of Antiquities of Theotida during construction of the new national road between Athens and Thessaloniki. This is the first such study for the 4th to 3rd millennium BC in eastern central Greece. The second project continues study of human remains from the Mycenaean cemetery at Kolikrepi, Sparta, by Niki Papakonsandinou, a PhD student at the Aristotle University of, the of Thessaloniki and an Iki fellow, supervised by St Sevi Triandafilo and myself. This summer, Niki piloted the application of an innovative method developed recently on prehistoric cemetery populations in Britain by Thomas Booth, Welcome Postdoctoral Research Associate at the Natural History Museum in London, who spent a period at the Fitch to test its application on samples from Kolikrepi and other Aegean cemeteries. Aimed at reconstructing the deposition history of the human body, the technique involves study of thin sections of human bone under a polarizing microscope to characterize diagenetic modifications of internal bone microstructure with an emphasis on bacterial bioerosion. The Fitch is, of course, known primarily as a center for ceramic studies, and ceramic research there is currently developing in several directions. The first is the study of technological landscapes. The diachronic examination of raw material selection and use and reconstruction of pottery manufacturing technologies in specific landscapes addressing questions of how traditions of making and using pottery were reproduced and how pottery supply and distribution patterns varied through time and across space in specific social and cultural contexts. The focus is always a site, usually a multi-period site, together with its surrounding landscape, and the study is diachronic. This map shows the extent of the work accomplished so far at the Fitch in almost 30 years, gradually expanding across the Aegean occasionally into, also into neighboring areas. And indicated here are a number of such projects currently in progress. The Tumba Thessalonikis, Castrion Kithara, Eretria and Lefkandi on Evia, Kakovatos and uh, Trifilia in Western Peloponnese, Palekastro in Eastern Crete, and Neopaphos on Cyprus. Each dot here represents a window into a higher resolution view of certain sites and landscapes. But equally, each represents cores drilled into their history since in each case, research moves across time. The accumula accumulation of detailed knowledge about whole regions through time, through multiple projects, allows us to explore both local trajectories and broad trends, making clear the great potential of such a bottom-up approach to help understand regional or even global phenomena. A second theme running through many projects is mobility. Mobility of goods, in this case pots, but more recently with a greater emphasis on mobility of craftspeople, with of course profound echoes in the modern world. This is the focus of a Marie Sklodowska Curie Individual Exchange Fellowship held by Bartek Lisch at the Fitch to investigate the advantages and pitfalls of addressing such issues through the technological study of pottery. Further, without losing its Aegean focus, the Fitch is moving further afield to understand the role of the Aegean within an even broader perspective. One research area here is the study of transport amphorae, and here we are taking forward the work of a previous Fitch director, Ian Whitbread, from Leicester University, both through additional work on northern Aegean amphorae sites, and also through the study of non-Greek transport amphorae found in the Aegean. This was the aim of postdoctoral fellow Dr. Leandro Fantuzzi, through an investigation funded by Charles Williams II, of the Punic Amphora building in Corinth, a puzzling 5th century BC structure in the Agora of Corinth that was filled with transport amphorae, specifically Punic amphorae, and richly preserved fish remains. In collaboration with Evangelia Kiriadzi, Noemi Müller, and Antonio Saez Romero of Seville University, Leandro seeks to unlock the building's mysteries. The project, through its emphasis on production sites in the West Mediterranean, mainly Southwest Spain, has begun to shed new light on the economic and cultural connections certain Greek cities maintained with the Western Mediterranean, during the centuries following the foundation of Greek emboria and colonies in these distant areas. Moving even further afield, for her recently awarded British Academy Postdoctoral Research Fellowship, based both in Newcastle uh, and at the Fitch, 
Maria Duggan launched a study of the numerous Aegean and Mediterranean imports identified at the windswept site of Tintagel, legendary home of King Arthur. Her goal is to shed light on the connections of the Byzantine Empire with the communities on the Atlantic coast and in Britain in the 5th to 7th centuries AD, an earlier post-Brexit period following Roman withdrawal from Britain. A first study of the Tintagel assemblage and sampling, were, and sampling were undertaken last autumn by Maria and Evangelia Kiriadzi with the help of Jackie Novakovsky of the Royal Cornwall Museum in Turo, the current excavator of the site. Beyond ceramics and metalworking, the Fitch is now expanding its scope into vitreous materials. An immediate catalyst was last year's annual Fitch lecture by long-standing Fitch Laboratories subcommittee chair, Professor Ian Freestone a review of scientific evidence and the production of glass in the Mediterranean from the first millennium BC to early medieval times. Ian will return to Athens in April to teach a new postgraduate training course on the archaeology and archaeometry of glass in the Mediterranean and Near East from the late Bronze Age to the early medieval period, together with Yael Gorin Rosen from the Israel Antiquities Authority. A pleasant reminder of the BSA's long history came in the form of the donation to our archive by Helena and James Graham of a diary kept between March and November of 1887, the first full year of the BSA's existence, by Emily Penrose, daughter of Francis Penrose, first director of the BSA. The, direct, the diary contains fascinating nuggets of information, such as observing the laying of the cornerstone of the new American school building next door on the 12th of March, a soiree at the Schliemann's on the 25th of March, or is it the Schliemann? Uh, and congratulations to Dr. Derpfeld on his appointment as director of the DAI on the 11th of July. She records visits to many sites, including Mycenae on the page shown here in the bottom right, and meetings with local figures such as Harry Lars Trukupis and Dimitrios Vakelas, a friend of Trukupis and later chairman of the Olympic Committee for the 1896 Games, who gave his name, of course, to the Vikilea Library in Heraklion. Emily, of course, went on to become an important figure in British academia, who campaigned for the conferment of degrees on women. She was principal of Bedford and Royal Holloway Colleges of the University of London, then of Somerville College from 1907 until her retirement in 1926, and she became Dame Emily Penrose in 1927. This long history is also reflected in our buildings and garden, which was subtly transformed last September by an exhibition staged by the NEON organization as its city project 2018, both echoing and challenging our historic space. Prosaic Origins, curated by Naya Yakumaki of Whitechapel Gallery, comprised a selection of works commissioned from Athens-based sculptor Andreas Lollis that were carefully positioned throughout the BSA garden, in the hostel foyer, and the Findlay common room. Lollis's use of marble, a noble stone with strong historical resonances, to carve everyday objects such as cardboard boxes, rubbish bags, ladders and planks of wood that reference the precarity of contemporary life in Athens, in juxtaposition with the BSA's oasis-like space, was clearly attractive. About 860 people attended the opening on the evening of 12th of September, while a total of 6,500 visits were recorded between then and the final day on the 14th of November. We most warmly thank Andreas Lollis and Naya Yakumaki for their creative input and the whole NEON team, led by director Elina Kunduri, for what was an extremely enriching collaboration. The NEON exhibition also afforded an opportunity for a British Open Day in collaboration with the UK's embassy in Athens. Visitors enjoyed guided tours of the ambassador's residence, formerly that of Eleftherios Venizelos, about whom more very shortly, and of the BSA's upper house, hostel and library and Fitch laboratory. This initiative represents one example of the many ways in which the BSA contributes to the UK's bilateral relations with Greece. And I emphasize that now because when I stand here in about a year's time, hopefully, to deliver an account of our activities in 2019, the UK will either have left the EU or will be on track to do so in an organized, we hope, way. In closing, I therefore take this opportunity to affirm that, for whatever form Brexit takes, the BSA remains fully committed to continued engagement with our many partners here in Greece, and indeed to developing and enhancing those valued partnerships and collaborations, as we continue our important mission to promote the study of Greece 
in all its aspects. And with that thought, I end this summary of the BSA's activities in 2018. Thank you.